Uh, yeah, Mary's right. Uh, it's some, some time that's not this time for me right now, but uh, I got 10 hours of sleep last night, so I am ready to go for this. Uh, I wanted to show you first a picture of me giving my first ever big talk. Uh, you can tell this was a long time ago. My hair was a lot shorter then. Uh, it was to a crowd roughly of this size, maybe a little bit larger than, than this size. There was a lot of people there. Uh, and like today, I could kind of see all the faces in the crowd, which for me personally is pretty intimidating. And I was, as I was waiting off stage, and they were introducing me on stage, Mary just gave the best introduction right now that I've, that I've ever received. Uh, for this talk, though, um, the person on stage started to describe a person with my name that definitely wasn't me. <laughs> Uh, she was describing someone uh, who she had seen speak at another conference, and she, she went on and on. And as I was standing off stage, I realized, oh, they invited the wrong person. Look at my face. I'm in so much pain. <laughs> oh, poor past Lara. Uh, but that was the end, right? So I kept doing. I kept on giving that talk, and I kept on trying to get better and better at public speaking. That talk didn't go well, <laughs> right? I hope that today's talk goes a little bit better than that talk does. But I've had the privilege of, of giving lots of talks now and trying to figure out what it means to feel like to be, to be in the spotlight and to say some, some prepared words to some folks without like puking on myself or tripping and falling as I got on stage. So again, the bar is set real low for me. I'm real excited to be here to, to talk about this with you. I especially want to highlight, though, that this isn't just about conference talks, right? There's many times in our work as lead developers where we have a metaphoric spotlight on us. And it's important for us to say some words and maybe to sound a little bit coherent and to make a point about something. So the skills that I'm using to not fall on my face right now as I'm speaking to you are the same ones that I use when I'm leading a meeting at work or my boss asks me to talk about what projects my team is working on or when I'm pitching a technical implementation in an architecture review. There are lots of different places where we have that spotlight on us. And we have to think about some words that we want to say and hopefully make it through that moment. You do these things already, right? They're a big part of our work as technical leaders. Think about what circumstances you already have in your daily work where there's that spotlight on you and you need to say something coherent. Most of us get nervous when we're in that spotlight. I'm going to guess that the majority of people in this room have a little bit of nerves when they think about public speaking. I promise I do, and the other speakers who you're seeing today also do. There's this famous study that found that uh, for Americans, public speaking is our number one fear more than heights or spiders or death. <laughs> so when I was doing research on this for the book, I put out a survey on Twitter and I, I asked folks what in particular made them fear public speaking. And the spectrum is huge. So again, my number one public speaking fear is that walk to the center of the stage and tripping and falling on my face. But with the public speaking survey, I realized that wasn't everybody's number one fear. So I'm going to read through a few of the fears that people shared. Let's see if some of this uh, resonates with you. People said, I'm afraid of the sound or pitch of my own voice. I'm afraid of my heart racing and therefore getting out of breath quicker or getting tongue tied. I'm, people, I'm afraid of people judging whether I'm dressed appropriately, of being judged for being fat, not on what I'm saying. I'm afraid of needing to pee while I'm talking. <laughs> I'm afraid of elegantly explaining something that is actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that one clearly resonated with this group, all right. <laughs> I'm afraid that I'm showing I'm ignorant about something that I thought I was knowledgeable about. I'm afraid of getting a question I can't even begin to answer. I'm afraid of not being impressive enough. I'm afraid that everything I say becomes so messy that anyone can refute it. I'm afraid that no one learns anything and the people who I'm talking to are starkly aware of it. I'm afraid of being exposed for the fraud that I have always felt like. As leaders, those of us in this room still forge through those fears every day. I think that we do this because it's on us to be leaders for our team. It's important that we don't have a meltdown every time we have that metaphoric spotlight on us. It's also important for us to model what it's like to be prepared or to give feedback or to teach someone something new. So every day, you and I are pushing through these fears and these nerves because we know it's important for us to keep doing this kind of work. 
So to help you get there and to get more comfortable, I'm gonna walk through different ways you can prepare your words and yourself. My goal is to help you reduce those fears for any of those spotlights, whether it's being on this physical stage or talking to your team or just having a really important one-on-one -on -one conversation. So for this talk, I've cherry-picked a few tactics that are relevant for any of those different speaking settings. We're gonna talk about finding the right words to say and how to practice them. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about feedback because it's crucial not just for those spotlight moments, right? As leaders, we are giving a lot of feedback, or we should be. And then we're gonna cover how to prep for your spotlight moment, and then we're gonna talk about how to celebrate it. <laughs> All right, so this is a section of people who, when they thought about their fears, they figured out that they were afraid of not getting their points across or being boring or rambling. Creating a solid structure for your content is the best way to guide your audience through your topic. Structure helps set expectations for what's next, helps strengthens your arguments, and helps keep folks more engaged. It also gives you a foothold if you lose that train of thought. So when we get nervous, we often try to jump right into what it is that we're trying to communicate. But it's important to set expectations at the top. Why are you there in that spotlight? Even before you jump into your narrative structure and thesis, make sure it's clear to the folks in the room what are you gonna cover? Why is it important to you or to them? And what do you hope that they're gonna walk away with? So by setting expectations up front, your audience, no matter how big or small, will be primed for what you're about to say next. You'll open up their ears and their brain, and it'll make it even easier for your info to land. You'll also start to notice me doing the things that I'm talking about in this presentation. I'm sorry, it might be distracting. I'm also hopeful that uh, all the other speakers feel really good about this stuff, because <laughs> uh, I know you'll also be thinking about this stuff as they're giving their talks. So uh, give yourself some structure, right? This could look like telling, telling a story to get your point across, or it could look like a thesis statement supported by uh, supporting arguments. So once you have that main nugget that you'd like to communicate, think about what you'll need to back it up and then help make it land. So when I've got a prepared thing to say and more than roughly 10 minutes to cover it in, I'm gonna walk you through the structure that I like to use. This works for moments like explaining a reorg to your team or defending your choice in an architecture review or giving a talk like this one on stage, either on a physical stage or like at a company meeting. All right, so I start with my landscape. So here's what exists. Then I give my analysis. So of that landscape, here's what I see. At the core is this issue. Here's what we could do about this. And here's the best option and how it works. For the options, I also like to live, give a lot of bad options to really highlight why my option is the right one. <laughs> Here are the reasons why you should believe me. And here's, I'm gonna always end on the bigger idea. So why does this concept matter to you, even if what I said is completely irrelevant or unrelated to your daily work? So where do you think we are in this narrative structure? We're here but also kind of here. So you'll see that I'll weave back and forth through this. I've built this talk so that it resonates with people struggling with different kinds of fears and also different kinds of spotlights. So once I determined that my point was that we all can and should be able to use our fears about public speaking to level up our game, I workshopped a narrative around it to support it. So once I had the basic structure nailed down, I iterated on my narrative to make sure it wasn't just a dry list of information. Because just saying words at you doesn't mean it's gonna land. You could list your work for your boss when you ask for a promotion, or just email a design to a client and hope that they get why it's the right move. But you know better. It takes some extra magic to help your audience really hear you or believe you. So let's talk through what stuff we can do to level up our content to make sure it's not just informational, but that it has that chance of landing. You may think it's smart to tell a joke. Firstly, jokes are terrifying. Don't feel like you have to be funny, be you. I am not a comedian. I'm not gonna stand up here and try to tell a bunch of jokes to keep you engaged. But in the drier parts of any talk that I'm giving, I'll see what I can incorporate to spice things up. So in this picture, I'm telling a story of a time when I didn't document an icon font well at Etsy. <laughs> it ended up causing one of the most hilarious bugs in Etsy history. Um, this horse head showed up in our star ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I didn't need to tell that story when I was giving this talk about how to make websites fast, but my talk was really dry in the part about web fonts. So I incorporated the story in a way that mostly made sense to help people, keep people engaged. And also, when I tell the story, it's pretty funny. I laugh, right, I'm grinning. I'm not actively telling a joke, but I'm keeping myself pretty entertained as I'm up here too, which I think makes me a better presenter. I do this throughout my spotlight moments. It can be subtle and secret, like putting a post-it note on your laptop when you open it with a message from your partner or something else that makes you smile. 
or it could be woven into your narrative structure, like that story about the horse head or these pictures of sloths. I can't help but grin when I see the sloth named Buttercup, right? <laughs> I'm a better speaker when there's something that makes me feel really good. And that means that my message lands a lot better with my audience. But it's really important to not distract your audience. So when I tell that story about horses or show Buttercup, I'm able to weave it in in a way that mostly makes sense. So I try to ensure it's not going to be a distraction of folks and that I'm not, it doesn't feel like I'm going off tangent. Unfortunately, when we incorporate humor or imagery like internet memes, we open ourselves up to alienating folks. I'm gonna bet that we've all been in that company meeting where someone used an inappropriate image to make their point without realizing how distracting it was for people in the room. So if you choose to make a joke or to use some imagery as part of your spotlight moment, triple check that it's not gonna accidentally offend or distract someone. The last thing you want is people who are listening to you to be caught off guard or triggered. And when I'm using imagery, I want to make sure that this imagery is as, is as inclusive as possible. So I'll use quotes and pictures of a diversity of humans and animals, because I think it's the responsibility of the person who has that soapbox, who's in that leadership position, to use that spotlight for good. Okay, so this is my number one recommended trick to get better at public speaking. Practice what you want to say in front of a small, chosen group of people and help them give you better, more actionable feedback. So doing this work of practicing your words and your body language and all and soliciting feedback on it from that trusted group will help you be a stronger leader. So though you may not have a reason to practice this particular bit in your day-to-day -day work stuff, I wanted to still go into detail on the feedback parts because as technical leaders, we all do have to do this work of, of giving and receiving feedback. So I wanted to make sure I went into this in detail today because I'm hoping it'll help you no matter what your circumstance. So unfortunately, humans are bad <laughs> at giving feedback. We're also really bad at preparing ourselves to receive feedback. This is true no matter the situation, hearing that we do something at home that drives our partner crazy or our coworker or our boss. And most of us are paralyzed by the fear of having these awkward conversations. We actively avoid asking for feedback because it's just so painful sometimes. Or we'll go out of our way to give non-specific general feedback sometimes via what some like to call compliment sandwiches. You looked great today. You really messed up at work last Friday, but you're really smart, right? That's like a compliment sandwich. We want to avoid those entirely. <laughs> so in this next section, I want to help encourage you to overcome your fear for, of asking for feedback and help people give you specific, actionable, and truly helpful feedback. So I'm gonna keep on using the example of getting feedback on some prepared words to ground this in specifics. But again, I'm hopeful that this feedback stuff will help you entirely in your daily work. All right, so first up, pick, figure out who, the, who that small crew is gonna be, your feedback crew. I usually like to stick with three to five people at first, especially if I'm workshopping something new that I wanna say. Uh, you may want to make sure that you pick people who uh, have some context, right? So either they know your future audience, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your team, maybe it's understanding what it's like to speak to other developers, um, or you want to pick people who are really good at giving feedback. They are rare and hard to find, but you should include them in all of your work from here on out. Um, it's also really important to not just pick people who are going to say nice things about you, because that entirely defeats the point, right? You want to pick people who will actually give you actionable and helpful stuff. All right, so the obvious choice for getting feedback is in person, right? But if practicing in front of people is less than comfortable, but you still like feedback on narrative or word choice or some other non-body language stuff, consider recording a dry run privately on your computer and then asking for asynchronous feedback from your crew. So my coworker practices alone, records his talk, and then sends it to others to get their thoughts on it via email. So this lets him dedicate time and brain space to the two separate parts, right? Recording and practicing that dry run, and then getting his brain in a, into a different place for actually receiving the feedback. But if you choose to practice your words in person, this is your chance to get, gather nonverbal feedback and practice reading the room. So this is a real photo of two audience members during one of my larger conference talks. I really hope that you all feel as engaged right now as they look. <laughs> I really wish I knew what I was saying <laughs> at this moment uh, when this happened. So as you're practicing with others, start to watch how people respond. Do they laugh? Do they lean towards you and look focused? Are they nodding? Do they look confused or distracted? When I first started giving this dry run of this talk, one of my coworkers fell asleep. 
it's really good feedback, right? Like, that's really helpful <laughs> for me to figure out what parts I should workshop and get better. So by tracking this kind of feedback, you'll develop a better sense about which parts of what you're saying are more engaging, or you move on from too quickly, or should be further workshopped. And by the way, this, this slide, slide image is really sneaky. That guy on the right is now my partner. I didn't know him very well when this photo was taken. But this makes me smile, right? Like, I get to see this in this part of my slides. <laughs> All right, so it can be nerve-wracking to request feedback, let alone on something as personal and anxiety-inducing as public speaking. It's key to set expectations to your feedback givers and prepare yourself to hear their notes. So do the same for your feedback crew, right? Give them details about the point that you want to make, who your audience will be, and what kind of feedback you're looking for. So here are just a few examples of the kinds of things you can ask your feedback crew to think about as you practice. By priming their brains ahead of time and cluing them into the kinds of feedback you're looking for, you'll both equip them well to help you and make sure you're ready for the kinds of things that they're gonna say. So for this prepared talk, I wanted to make sure that the flow of the content made sense and I didn't jump around too much. So when I practiced, I asked my crew to pay special attention to whether or not I was building the information in a way that flowed. So when you're doing this practice run, don't stop if you fumble your words or if you make a mistake. Lots of us just instinctively stop when we mess up during a run through. We'll fumble our words or something, and we'll stop and we'll sigh, and there's this voice inside of our heads that just, like, just wants to wallow in that moment, right? But it's really important to practice recovering from that fumble and making it through. You can't get stuck there. You have to practice making those mistakes and recovering from them because working on reducing that fear is the most important part of practicing. If you're able to make that mistake and make it through to the end a bunch of times, you'll feel much more equipped when you're finally in that spotlight. <laughs> if it happens again, you know you'll be more confident to make it through that issue. Okay, so first, after the run through, thank your crew and take a moment to shift your brain into feedback receiving mode. Let your crew know how you'd like to receive their thoughts and when. Maybe you're energized from the practice talk and you wanna just high five and dive right into that conversation then and there. Or maybe a little drained and you're like, I can return to this some other time and get your feedback later. So again, it's okay to request their com comments separately and in a different medium. Consider setting up an anonymous Google Doc if you don't wanna know who said what and ask people to fill that out that way. Remember, we're aiming to reduce your fear and your feedback crew is gonna wanna help and support you in any way that they can. So have you ever had someone tell you, you did a great job? Probably, right, we're all lead developers in this room. So it feels good for like a minute. But then you probably start to wonder like, oh, but like, what about that was good? Or like, what did you like? Or, you know, was there something I should keep doing or do more of? Or, or is there still stuff I could like change to make more impactful? What we crave is feedback that's gonna help us grow. Something to help our message land or to have more of an impact or to know specifically what it is that people value. So let's talk about how to get that kind of feedback from folks. So a company called Life Labs developed a way to think about feedback that uses suits of cards. So you can tell here that some feedback is general, some feedback is specific and actionable, and then we've got stuff that makes us feel really good, and stuff that's like a little bit harder to hear, right? Some negative or constructive criticism. So hearts are feedback that's positive but not specific, like, I really liked your talk. That's just a heart. It feels really good for a moment, but actually what we're looking for is diamonds, stuff that's specific and actionable. So I thought your talk was funny, especially when you showed that picture of the horse that made me laugh. You know, something specific or even better, something that says, um, definitely keep on doing this for all of your talks in the future. Or this is what I specifically appreciated about the talk that you gave. We're all aiming for those diamonds. So clubs are feedback that's negative, but not specific or constructive. Like, I thought your talk was boring. <laughs> Don't ever say that to anybody. Instead, focus on my making a spade, right? Feedback that's negative, but gives specific suggestions. So my mind started to wander when you got to this part. Could you consider changing up the visual or telling a different story or something else to keep my, my brain back and engaged? So this is a great shorthand for getting the kind of feedback that you like. Explain these to your crew and then ask them to give you diamonds or spades. So part of what makes diamond and speed back, feedback so valuable is that focus on the actionable item. It gives you something specific to respond to. So if your feedback is sharing more clubs, or hearts rather, like this comment from an eighth grader at a career day, uh, this is a heart, I wish it was a diamond, I really wanna know what about me was really fun and cool. <laughs> <laughs> So if your feedback crew is doing this with you, giving you lots of spade, or clubs rather, or lots of hearts, 
ask them open questions, turn their feedback towards the actionable or the concrete. So can you help me understand why you think I should include a code sample, or what specifically about that felt boring, or how can I make this more powerful? All right, so there's a chance that your public speaking moment will involve responding to surprise questions. Your boss, or your client, or your teammates, whoever you're talking to, they may have some follow-ups. How scary is this? We've spent all of our time preparing <laughs> our words and what we want to say. Now we have to improvise. Don't worry, there's some stuff you're going to do to prepare for this too. So in that survey that I put out on Twitter, people said that they're afraid that they're not going to understand the questions or that someone will point out a hole in their premise that they entirely overlooked or that they'll be belittled because someone knows or think they know more about me than I do on my topic. So have you ever <laughs> attended a talk and actively rooted against a speaker? I'm going to guess no, right? Like, how have you felt when you watch a speaker get tongue-tied or get asked a tough question or lose their train of thought? It's painful to watch because as humans, we have empathy. We for sure don't want to be the person in that spotlight, and we don't want that person who's in that spotlight to feel bad or to worry. If you've seen a presenter slip up, you know how good it feels when they make a comeback and regain their composure, charging on to deliver their content. Remember, your feedback crew is here to help you, and so is your audience. A major breakthrough for me as an engineering leader came when I realized that I could say I don't know, and it could go extremely well. <laughs> no matter how deep of an expert you are in a topic, there will always be questions that you're unprepared to answer. And frankly, whether it's an audience like this or an audience of your coworkers, saying out loud is so much better than trying to make up an answer. <laughs> so there are many ways to say I don't know in a positive and encouraging way, so I'll practice. Oh, actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm gonna look that up right after and tweet about it or get back to you. Or, oh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that before. Who else could I ask? Or in conference settings, I will sometimes straight up ask the audience, oh, that's a really good question. Does anybody else here know the answer? Can you raise your hand? Go talk to that person. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're speaking to a larger audience like this one, remember that the goal of answering questions is not to make everybody happy nor is it to teach material that's irrelevant to your point. For the most part, you are still the person who's in charge when you're in that spotlight. You have a lot of power to reframe questions, move on from weird questions, and do whatever you can to help the audience listening continue to learn. Running a practice Q&A can help you vet answers and phrasing, get comfortable saying I don't know, and develop those strategies and coping mechanisms for your key fears. So ask your feedback crew for some follow-up questions on your topic. And once you feel good on that front, you can level up your prep and ask them to give you tougher questions. Ask that test audience to imagine creative ways that people could misunderstand your point, right? Or to go on complete tangents. We've all had that person in the crowd say, this is more of a statement than a question, <laughs> right? We've, Ask your feedback crew to, to practice that with you or to practice giving you incorrect information while you're on stage or to bring up those typical arguments that go nowhere like, but isn't X a better language than Y, right? Maybe they say, say something silly or weirdly aggressive. Getting some practice handling this will make you feel more prepared for surprises when you're finally in that spotlight. And this is by far the most fun thing for your feedback crew. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. So you figured out what it is that you want to say. You found your groove in saying it. You've practiced a bit and hopefully gotten some feedback that will help you make your words and your speaking style even more impactful. So this last leg of our journey is to figure out which bits of our environment we can tweak to set ourselves up for success. So, <laughs> I'm gonna let that sink in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so think about what clothing will help you get in that mindset for your moment. So what's gonna make you feel like a superhero? What could you wear that will make you feel the strongest, most secure, and most grounded when you're in that spotlight? What I'm wearing right now makes me feel like myself, but like a slightly dressier version of myself. It holds up to the stage lights and the weight of the battery pack clipped to it, and it doesn't make too much sound when I move around the stage, and it hides my flop sweat pretty well, and it looks like I'm taking this event seriously, right? And the most important thing for my own fears, I'm not going to trip and fall on these shoes. I feel pretty good while I'm up here. So one time, the conference I was speaking at was completely unprepared to connect my Mac laptop to a projector. Thank goodness I had my slide deck and fonts saved to a thumb drive. I was able to load it up on someone else's computer. I can't tell you how much better I feel standing here knowing that I have a backup plan ready to go if my laptop dies. I can just hand it to the excellent AV team here. So if you're just giving a demo of some work, check to see what happens if your internet suddenly drops. 
Maybe record a screencast on it just in case, because it's better to feel prepared and not need it than to go without it at all and worry about it. So did anybody over here see me power posing <laughs> through this door, right? Uh, this is a little bit of Superman. You can also do starfish. It's, there's a whole great Amy Cuddy TED talk about power poses and how uh, they change the chemical balance, the chemical makeup of your body to make, to make you do better, right? They had this great research that was done that showed that people who power posed before they went on job interviews got the job more often. <laughs> so I recommend this. You'll look ridiculous, but as long as you're doing it off stage and no one can probably see you, you'll probably feel safe and secure doing it. So find a bathroom, find a corner, find somewhere else where you can take a deep breath and center yourself and get yourself ready for that moment. All right, so I'm up here, I'm doing it. I'm hoping it's going well. I know which parts have kind of stumbled through and I've got a better sense from you all about which stories are landing and <laughs> which ones aren't. So let's talk about what happens next after you have that spotlight moment. <sighs> Take a big deep breath, right? Be proud of what you've accomplished. Your primary work is done. You've delivered your prepared words. Maybe you've answered some questions. And now it's time to check in with yourself. So after you say the thing you wanted to say, it's important to gather some feedback, even if it's just from your own gut, about what you can improve for next time. Because this won't be the last time as a lead, you've said some prepared words to some people. So as Raquel Velez says, talks don't define you, you define you. Talks come and go, but every single one will make you a better you. Then, eat a donut. <laughs> so years ago, I found out that when, whenever something happened in my career, maybe I got published or promoted or launched a project, I wouldn't take the time to celebrate that achievement. I'm an achiever by nature, the kind who feels like every day starts at zero. So not deliberately marking these moments left me feeling like I wasn't actually accomplishing anything. Oh, cool, that article went up, I would think, and then I would just move on with my day. And once I realized that that was happening, I decided to be deliberate about marking achievements by eating one donut. <laughs> Sometimes more than one if it's like a really big deal. <laughs> so the act of donut eating has helped me feel like I'm accomplishing my career goals because it forced me to take a minute with myself, right, and to focus on that accomplishment because donuts to me feel like a celebration. So I started to share this idea with more people and I found that it resonated with others, especially young career-driven women who are routinely achieving goals and furthering their career but don't take the time to note their own success. So find out what your version of a donut is. Make sure that you're acknowledging to yourself the huge accomplishment of saying some prepared words under a spotlight. It's a big deal, and you should be sure to celebrate it. We're here now. <laughs> so why do I care? Why am I traveling to New Zealand and back to New York to share this stuff with people? So I believe, and I think that you all believe, that we in this industry need a spectrum of new voices. Whether that's in a product brainstorming session and you see a brand new point of view, or in a team code review when you learn a new technique that someone's implemented. If you're a member of an underrepresented community in tech, please know that I wrote the book on this stuff for you. It is built to help you get up on a metaphoric or literal stage and help you do this, to help keep you safe, and to help you learn and grow and share with your boss or other higher ups, with your team, and with your community. If you're not a member of an underrepresented community in tech, please help those who are get access to this information. We need diverse voices. We want to learn from their work and their insight. And we need a broader spectrum of voices to help us move forward as an industry. So please use these tactics to help those fellow future leaders find that spotlight. We are rooting for you. So I've got 10 copies of the book to give away. It's at the Etsy desk. I'll be doing that at the afternoon break, so not the lunch break. But that break, but if you don't get that one, if you want an ebook, you can use this coupon code to get 15% off it. It's called Demystifying Public Speaking. Thank you so much. Yeah.